this uh, the plant uh, serves about a service area about 150,000 city of San Mateo, Foster City, Hillsdale, Crystal Springs. So we have some other uh, contributors to our flow. Um, we are we are in the process of upgrading uh, the existing infrastructure on the solid side of this plant because within the next five years we'll be building a new uh, membrane bioreactor facility across the way. You can see it actually uh, really well from the bus in the lot where they're going to be building that. And they're just starting to break ground there. They just cleared all the trees out from that lot and they'll start building an administration building there I think within the within the next year for sure. So. Um, Basically, the things I want to talk about today uh, are, are our, our CNG facility that we have here, and then uh, I'll go on and I'll just talk about some aspects of the new plant. So, uh, at this plant, we have two large egg-shaped digesters. You can see in the distance here. Uh, the middle uh, silo there is uh, the sludge storage tank. These, uh, both these. Uh, both these digesters operate in series, so that means that uh, one tank is filled, and as it is filled, it spills over into the next tank. Uh, so it's a series operation. Uh, these are these egg-shaped digesters are very good for keeping the sus solid suspended and mixing it very well. Um, we basically get about usually between 68 and 70 percent VS reduction with these with these uh, digesters running in series, which is if you guys operate digesters, it's really really good. Typically, when you run them in parallel operation, you might get like 55 or 60 percent VS reduction. Anyways, uh, we produce about 200,000 cubic feet per day of biogas from both these digesters and uh, the digested sludge in the in the storage tank, of which. Um, about the, the, the CNG system is designed to be able to, to uh, put through about two-thirds of that flow, which is about 100 cubic feet a minute if it's running properly, or at, at capacity, I should say. So why don't we, uh, we're going to walk over here, and we're going to check out the skid where the biogas is cleaned up, where we store the biogas um, uh, before it's actually cleaned up, and then we're going to walk over to the fueling station, and then we'll come back here and we'll talk about the new plant. CNG, what this refers to is uh, this technology is used to clean up biogas, basically you're moving CO2, hydrogen sulfides, siloxanes, and basically producing a, a natural gas equivalent where uh, we have the methane concentration somewhere above 92% with the balance being CO2 and nitrogen for the most part. So um, the idea is that the city uh, will utilize this system to fuel our own vehicles and vehicles from surrounding customers. Uh, it's like a fill the dreams, you build it and they will come. Because like right now, I believe we only have three vehicles that are filled up uh, from this from this system. And I believe the city will be purchasing about 17 of them next year. So we'll start picking up the demand for the, using, this, the, using this system. But the idea is here, uh, is basically what we're doing is we're avoiding, you know, we're buying natural gas powered vehicles and avoiding the cost of using gasoline and the CO2 associated with, you know, CO2 is being mitigated from the, the petroleum hydrocarbon uh, source. So uh, the idea is that the city, I, I believe, uh, the, the avoided cost is about $4 per gallon uh, of uh, gasoline equivalents. So basically putting through 100 cubic feet of digester gas to this at a constant rate all day long, we could produce about 500 gas gallon equivalents per day if the system's running at full capacity at 100 cubic feet per minute, which is not what it's running right now. I think we're about a tenth that, and we'll be working our way up. So the way this works is um, when 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 the, the the fuel when the fuel island starts drawing fuel. You know, people are gassing up their cars, it lowers the pressure of tanks at the end of this. And what this does is it puts this skid in operation. What this skid does is at 100 cubic feet a minute, it draws it draws the biogas through this uh, hydrogen sulfide removal uh, media right here. This also removes some of the VOCs. It then passes into the skid where it's uh, cooled so the water condense, more of the water will condense pressure and uh, molecular filtration basically uh, allows uh, methane to pass through a porous membrane and maintain CO2 on the other side. So the, basically what we get off the skin is about 60 cubic feet. But for every 100 cubic feet, we get 60 cubic feet of the, the uh, natural gas quality uh, gas and 40 is rejected and put off in the off gas flow. 
which is burned in this very uh, high-end flare we have here. We have a three-stage flare. Basically at the lowest flow, there's just one burner at the bottom. Um, and then when we get about, I think, 65 cubic feet a minute, it goes up to the next stage. And then when it's higher, it goes up to the next. Uh, when you burn biogas, you need to maintain the proper temperature that it's flared at and stuff like that, or else uh, you re you'll release more NOx and SOx than you want to, because that's how that's controlled, mostly by the flame temperature. Does anybody have any questions about this part? Yeah, there's always... Um, Repeat the question. The gentleman was asking if the if a digester removes all the solids or, or some of them are still retained after the process. Any anaerobic process is never going to break down all the solids that's going to be available to it in that retention time. It only spends about 30 days in these tanks. Anaerobically, I mean, you know, like I said, we get about 70% tops of ES reduction. So that means that 70% of our organic matter is trans it's, it's transformed to biogas. So it, it's pretty good, actually. But but um, there's always going to be residual unless you know you have geological time to wait for it all to degrade. So you know if you have limited time, not everything, nothing ever degrades all the way. That's a little philosophical, I guess. But sorry. <laughs> Uh, gentleman asked who maintains it. Um, we are hiring, uh, we, we, we just put out a service contract to have it maintained because it's a very busy environment over here. And there's lots of things to keep an eye on and monitor frequently. It's really, a, the SCADA intervention is really, it, you know, we know exactly what's going on with this, but actually having someone to fix it is a different issue. So it is, it's a practical, a practical constraint for sure. That's a Barrick a ver ver flare, yeah. It's, a, it's like the fanciest one I've ever seen. We used to just have a candlestick flare that burnt the gas. It wasn't, it wasn't even a, it wasn't regulated at all. It was grandfathered in. And now this one's very tightly regulated. So I'm still trying to figure out what the initials stand for. Compressed natural gas. CNG, compressed natural gas. We didn't hear you. All right, um, let's, let's walk back this way and I'll show you guys uh, the storage container and how that works, why we use it. Okay guys, um, this is our, our gas storage bag. What this does is it, it tries to, it, 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 it fills and empties uh, depending on the gas demands. We maintain a pressure of about 14 inches of water column in the system. And uh, basically, since that skid will draw at, you know, a constant 100 cubic feet per minute when it's operating, um, if the boiler is operating at the same time, which also runs on biogas, uh, the demand will be exceeded for the biogas and we'll start pulling vacuum in the line, which is, which is bad. So what we do is we can store about 50,000 cubic feet in this container. This is a, a double line structure here. Uh, these, these blowers over here, all they're actually doing is they're actually sucking air out of that out of the out of the envelope in between, which creates a lower pressure so the bag can fill up on the inside. And then when we need to use it, the, the, the blowers can turn on the other way and actually will or yeah, they turn on the other way and basically create a little a slightly higher pressure which squeezes the bag down inside this big bag. So this always looks like this on the outside. Um, we had, we had lots of issues with this. You can see this little shack that's built around these, these, these air pumps, these blowers. Um, what was happening was air was like bouncing off this uh, digester right here and like reverberating on the inside of this. We had to put a buffer on this. Because it was bouncing and you know there was a, a receptive neighbor about a mile away and that caused huge, huge problems in the city. So. But that's all take care of now. You can tell it's not that loud. I, I didn't think it ever was myself. But other people, you got to worry about the, the squeaky wheels. So, so the exterior structure is actually collapsed. Yeah, if this, if you cut off the air to this and let it drain, it would just like coming in down to a tile. Yeah, it's just a big, a big ring, and the bottom's flat, and it has a moisture recovery on the bottom. So with this system, um, there's, a, there's a line that runs all the way from the, uh, the initial uh, CNG cleanup skid that we first looked at. It runs along the back wall. And then it goes to this uh, device right here, which is another uh, dryer and compressor. These, 
everybody who engineers a system wants to protect their own system, even though the, the, the moisture is taken out downstream or upstream. So uh, what this ha what this does is uh, the, it flows from this com this compression skid into uh, one of these uh, one of these Angie uh, compressor uh, an Angie compressors, and there's this huge valve box right here. So the way this is controlled is you see there's these three banks of tanks, and they all have different pressures of the of the uh, CNG in them. So the first one, the high bank, holds up 4,200 psi. I think it goes down to about 32 psi by the end. And the idea is, as at the fueling station, uh, you know, the higher pressure of the gas you start with, the faster the vehicle is going to fill. So I think you fill up vehicles to. Actually, I can't remember. I've never done it, and it's been like six months since I watched one doing it. So, um, it, you know, you can fill up your vehicle in like five or ten minutes from this the, when the high bank is charged. So when you start sucking gas out of these, it, like I said before, it calls for gas uh, from the other end uh, for, the, for the skid to come on. But anyways, um, so uh, along with the vehicles the city's thinking about purchasing or is going to be purchasing uh, with our new administration building, uh, they're thinking that maybe some of the gas needs could also be met by, by using some of this, this processed biogas because the avoided cost of the natural gas and the mitigation of the CO2, it's really, you know, it's, a, it's an economic incentive for the city. Apparently, the city could get up to like $700,000 a year if it's using this in, you know, the full utility of the system and uh, dis dispensing all this gas to the right places, so. Um, does anybody have questions about that? Do you need specialty maintenance contracts for this as well? Yeah, these are all, I mean, our, our, our maintenance people uh, and operators keep an eye on, see how it's working, but these are, this whole system will be under a maintenance contract. It, you know, it requires at least a, a, an extra person that, and you know how hiring is now, like we discussed at the last place. It's hard to have good people. Find out. How is it dispensed? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't get to that part yet. There's a, um, if you walk over here, you can see that there's a, a, an, an act, a, a gate here that allows you to access a fuel island over here. Oh, oh. Oh, I see, okay. So you could, a, a bus can drive through here and fill up any size vehicle, practically size vehicle. So, so like right now, like I was saying, I think we only have three or four vehicles that are filled by this. So it's not really being underutilized and it's, it's uh, looking to the future to, to use this more. And we're trying to actually get a customer from the outside to, 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 buy, to, to sell our uh, product to. So if anyone has an LPG uh, vehicle, call the city. When was it completed? I think uh, uh, this was commissioned uh, in November. It's been less than a year. What, what, is it, it, what is equivalent to propane? What's that? What is it equivalent to propane? Or could you, could you substitute that? Are you no, no, that? it's not equivalent to propane. It would have, okay, so it's, it's, it's mostly methane, right? Yeah. So methane only has one carbon atom and propane has three. So the energy density of the propane is gonna be about yeah. approximately three times higher. Oh, okay, that's it's gonna yeah, be yeah. for that thing. So this has the, what, what's the energy density of, uh, what's it, a thousand BTUs? Or a, uh, yeah, this is probably yeah. between 900 and 1,000 BTUs per cubic foot. And I, yeah, I mean, propane's probably 2,500 or 3,000. I don't know off the top yeah. of my head. So it, should, it couldn't be switched to encourage people no, to use it that way? No, and also propane is will turn to liquid at this high pressure. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think some generators might come with kits that could be used. Oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Not sure. But, but um, right, I mean, I, I typically, uh, you could, uh, like our boiler, it can run natural gas or it can run biogas, depending, you know, it just has to change the carburation on it. Right. 